So good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome once again to yet another session at the uh, CAPM 2021. The session, as you know, is on sustainable finance, a huge value at stake. Uh, sustainability has rapidly gained uh, significance across markets globally, and we're delighted to have this discussion on the growing importance of sustainable uh, finance at this CAPM edition against the background of India's sustainability targets for 2030. Uh, pace of ESG adoption in India has accelerated and there is a lot of consciousness arousing, uh, arising across uh, stakeholders in this. And regulators, of course, have also been making policies to strengthen ESG reporting, etc. The uh, example of BRSR, which uh, the SEBI is working on being made mandatory for India's top thousand listed uh, companies from FI 22 23 is uh, one of those. Again, leading public and private funds with significant India exposure have committed a shift to ESG focused portfolios. Uh, company leaders are incorporating ESG into their mission and values, endeavoring to fully integrate into the strategy and operations of their companies. Four out of five Nifty 50 firms have voluntarily made their ESG compliance data public. And uh, in the FIKI report that we released yesterday, sir, uh, McKenzie has pegged India's sustainable funding requirement at $2 trillion by 2030. And this indeed calls for a new ways to consider financing and investing in ESG initiatives. And the good news is that corporates with higher ESG ratings are showing superior financial and non-financial performance. And ESG investments are increasing and outperforming the uh, broader markets. Uh, so against this positive note, uh, very happy to welcome, sir, uh, to have you amidst us uh, for this very session. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, we all know uh, Mr. Rajaraman is an IS officer, having served in various administrative, administrative positions in areas of investment promotion, FDI, public sector undertakings, etc. And uh, He's also spearheading the uh, role at uh, DEA on the task force of sustainable finance, the very topic that we are discussing today. And out of my personal experience, we've had uh, several opportunities to work with him across various aspects of his role at DEA. And each time we've had commendable support from him in driving the agenda in a very positive and appropriate uh, direction. This is one in other areas, sir, which we'll be kind of working with you very closely on and really look forward to your support uh, going forward here as well. And with these words, sir, may I hand it over to you for your keynote address. So, Mr. Rajaram, please. Uh, thank you and uh, good evening to all of you. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, um, um, of this uh, discussions today on uh, um, on various ways of, of raising capital uh, for, uh, for a developing country like India where the development needs are are substantial and uh, and varied. So uh, one of them obviously is sustainable finance. I mean, uh, given the fact that uh, uh, I mean uh, that though this topic of sustainable finance has been around for a long time, I guess COVID has acted as the big global reset. I mean, in the in the sense that uh, normally it is only in times of crisis that people sit back and then look at uh, reality in 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 realistic terms. I mean. So sometimes uh, we uh, uh, the 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 market uh, goes or leads us in a direction that sometimes takes us from the real to the unreal. So probably uh, COVID has been beneficial in that respect. I mean, it has probably made the world get shocked out of its uh, of its business as usual approach, and uh, has brought back the green agenda in a very substantial way. So um, I mean, as 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 we are all aware, I mean, I think the uh, the, uh, the 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 G20, which is a very important forum in in, in the sense that uh, I mean it it uh, it counts for a significant percent of the percentage of the world's GDP, uh, and and also the population uh, has uh, has taken this uh, topic uh, in a very important way. I mean, I think in fact for the first time under the Italian presidency, we have a, a, a working group on sustainable finance, uh, which has been which has been created. Which, uh, which is looking into all aspects of sustainable finance, um, especially in terms of uh, climate finance disclosures by companies and also the aspects of, uh, uh, of uh, making available finance available at an affordable rate for developing countries and uh, low-income countries. So this, uh, 
this this is expected to actually gain momentum as we uh, um, uh, towards the end of the year when cop 26 uh, meets and 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 uh, and takes uh, a look at some of these recommendations uh, made by the g20 uh, as part of the uh, international uh, climate convention which happened very recently subsequent to the finance ministers and central bank governors meet so as a result of all these international uh, i mean um, traction that uh, sustainable finance is getting uh we are very sure that uh, more and more work will be done uh, to uh, to give effect to the uh, to the uh, to the um, uh, to a global framework which will probably enable uh, both parties both on the demand side and supply side to to uh, to work in a in a in a in a, con- in a trustworthy manner so as to grow this market man already if you look at it in the during the covid period a lot of the uh, uh, The, the the funds I mean, which are there I mean, nothing like for instance uh, soar and wealth funds or pension funds um, and many other in- insurance funds and a lot of other very large funds have actually changed the uh, their their investment uh, goals I mean, in the sense that they have declared greater allegiance to esg investing and therefore we find we have found that during the covid period a lot of uh, fundraising has happened in uh, in esg which i think is very substantial and uh, and it gives hope that probably a lot of this fund will also eventually flow flow into india so uh, uh, but obviously i mean some of these issues some of the issues relating to uh, the demand side and the supply side need need more clarity especially on the issues of uh, 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 of taxonomy of uh, of of all the activities that get undertaken and get classified as esg and also uh, in terms of uh, the disclosures which companies make about which uh, you spoke uh, uh, I mean, uh, about jo- which jodi spoke so essentially these are some of the uh, uh, market related uh, what do you say information uh, asymmetries which which probably need to be set right uh, in course of time if this market has to deepen uh, uh, and and grow so uh, the role of the regulators here is very very significant and uh, we believe that all the regulators are also in the path of uh, of uh, creating uh, of, of of developing a very uh, a very um effective understanding of the, of the of the issues involved in sustainable finance and enable the market and lay down standards and regulations which enable the market to grow in a very uh, organized and uh, and systematic fashion now if you look at india's uh, uh, um, um progress i mean uh, all of us are aware that i mean the nationally determined contributions uh, are are our commitments to the paris agreement and, and and climate constitutes one very important aspect of climate Uh, 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 important aspect of esg so uh, the national action plan on climate change has been strengthened on the lines of ndcs and uh, we uh, have in fact very recently the uh, the union um, uh, um, uh, environment and forest minister and climate uh, minister for climate change uh, has, has made a very strong statement in the in the in the international climate convention on the on where india stands and uh, the uh, and india has actually uh, made great contributions to the in, in achieving the ndcs uh, in a very significant way especially in terms of uh, the uh, the renewable energy targets and so on and so forth there are a lot of other things where i think that there is a lot of progress so we believe that uh, all this uh, efforts where we are looking at implementation of the of the paris goals uh, uh, that we have already com- that we are committed to under as part of the ndcs require a lot of financing a very significant amount of financing in uh, in both the power sector which is the most significant sector as far as uh, uh, climate is concerned in terms of the transportation sector where uh, which is yeah. next next contributor uh, or the second largest contributor in terms of emissions and so on and so forth and and also the manufacturing and uh, and, uh, and and the construction sector so i am very sure that uh, these opportunities are 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 manifold and uh, the paris uh, accord and the cop26 discussions uh, i mean aided and assisted by the g20 discussions will only help us to actually to uh, push uh, ourselves forward in the in this uh, in, in towards uh, deepening the esg fi- uh, finance market in india which will lead us to fulfill a lot of these commitments that we have take, taken men now in terms of the sustainable development goals I men i think the 2030 agenda I men of, of which all of us are aware Uh, is also a very important component of this uh, financing uh, I mean effort and uh, we believe that uh, uh, all this uh, put to, uh, put together will will evolve in period of time uh, to uh, to le- uh, leading to uh, a deeper uh, deepening of this uh, of this esg finance market in india 
now uh, under the uh, under the climate finance uh, fi financing requirement the international um, the developing countries are actually committed for for about nearly about 100 billion dollars of annual financing for uh, for developing countries uh, and uh, I mean, I mean there, there are reports that some, something like 60 to 80 uh, billion dollars have uh, are being I mean plowed into developing an uh, uh every year but though of course there is a there is a debate as to whether this money is actually coming in so therefore I mean, the long and short story, which I would like to say in the global front, there is enough happening for us to assure ourselves that uh, that this market is, is is changing for the good. And there will be uh, there is there is a lot of merit in 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 all of us, especially the, the market participants and the regulators here in India in, in, in taking the bull by the horns and looking at uh, standardizing the market so as to enable receipt, uh, receipt of, of larger amounts of ESG investing from abroad. And also to create the appetite for uh, for green invest investments amongst the investors in India. So I think that I mean, so we need to break up this market into two parts: one, the global suppliers of capital, and the domestic suppliers of capital. While the global suppliers of capital obviously I mean would be driven by all these uh, uh, forces which which I just talked about, and I'm sure that there is a there's a very clear traction uh, or movement uh, uh, towards the the greening of of the, of the financial networks uh, abroad. Whereas, in, I mean, in terms of the local financial market or the local supply of capital, I mean, I think the, in the HNIs and the institutional finance, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done, I mean, I think. So, in terms of creating the appetite for uh, or making a business case for, for green financing. So, therefore, uh, um, we, I mean, we, as a result, we have a, a fairly undeveloped green uh, finance market in India. I mean, I would say, like, say, take the case of the green bond market. I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done to actually to deepen these markets in India, and there is need for creating both from the from the demand side the the, uh, the demand for for uh, for green uh, finance uh, instruments. So um, um, I feel that the role played by the the industry, uh, the users of capital or the, uh, the 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 recipients of capital, to demonstrate uh, the the that the end use of capital would be uh, would be assured. Uh, in, the, in the manner that uh, the, the issuers would, uh, would would like it like it to be, and also to uh, to uh, to also demonstrate that perhaps uh, 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 I mean while not all uh, suppliers of capital would would probably uh, um, live with a with a with a discount on their on, on their on their expectations of return on investment, um, the, the market at large believes that uh, I mean I mean especially the in, the Indian suppliers of capital look for. Uh, um, the, uh, demonstration that this this is also a, a sound uh, an investment case. So therefore, uh, I mean, I mean, there is no doubt that some of our uh, uh, green investment uh, portfolios, which include renewable investments and so on and so forth, have demonstrated their ability to to return uh, a capital. I mean, I think, I mean, of course, over the long term. So, but there is a need for actually to to have uh, more and more use cases of successful application of uh, of finance to the green uh, development sector, uh, demonstrating that it also would uh, would, would generate uh, um, uh, market return rates of return to sufficient enough to induce uh, uh, the the, uh, the the suppliers of capital. Now, uh, I mean, if you look at the uh, the other uh, the other developments in the market, I mean, obviously, I mean, some of them include uh, things like say the uh, what uh, has been ha happening on a uh, on a voluntary basis, like for instance, recently as uh, Jodi has put it, companies have uh, large companies have put out uh, reports which disclose a lot of their uh, a lot of lot of data on the on, on the on the uh, on the uh, climate related uh, aspects of their business. The, uh, the SEBI's uh, BRSR um, directive also uh, has uh, has enabled a lot of this data to come out to the market. So we believe that uh, a lot of these efforts, both voluntary, I mean, and driven by the need to actually to con convince the market that uh, uh, that their business has uh, has, a, has a case for green investing. Uh, there is also a drive from the regulator uh, on mandatory uh, on a mandatory basis. So we hope that this uh, dual track will help the uh, market to come out with uh, with sound uh, disclosure uh, standards. Which enable the investors to take uh, to assure themselves that uh, that the investments they make are really in, uh, 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 I mean, a green or social or or in uh, or in the governance sectors as as uh, as they have um, as as they believe uh, they, they they are. Now uh, I would also like to talk about the uh, 
on the uh, on the on the, on the sustainability uh, side the uh, the um, government of india also made a budget announcement relating to the social stock exchange wherein uh, um, 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 a forum or a, or, a, or a platform is is to be developed to enable the market to raise money for sustainable de development goals and this uh, the the report is under examination and we hope that the re, uh, between the regulator and the government very soon we should be able to uh, launch the the exchange enabling the uh, uh, the market to raise fina finance for various purposes including areas such as uh, impact investing the uh, india is also a, a founder member of the international platform on sustainable finance uh, which is a european commission led platform uh, for uh, to scale up su environmentally sustainable private investments and ipsf is a rel relatively new initiative and i hope uh, along with the uh, the uh, the um, the g20 and the uh, cop26 we should be able to uh, create greater uh, pressure for the uh, greater uh, emergence of of global standards on on disclosures and taxonomies and so on and so forth so uh, i would uh, um, end uh, by saying that uh, the uh, the government of india has, has 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 also taken a very important initiative by setting up a task force uh on sustainable finance the the, the task force has uh, uh, has uh, um, set up a couple of working groups on taxonomy and and on disclosures etc we hope that probably by the end of the year we would uh, we would have some recommendations which enable the the uh, the government as well as the regulators to to actually to push ahead with uh, with some of the reforms that the market is required to 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 get uh, to enable greater flow of investments into india and also to to uh, to um unlock a lot of the investment opportunities that that are available in the sustainable financing sector now uh, i would also uh, like to uh, say that uh, um while we talk about uh, climate related financing which is very very important i mean we uh, the 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 sustainable development goals are are extremely important from a from a from a particular perspective of infrastructure because i think india um, as as you are all aware I mean, has put out a a target of of investing about nearly about 111 lakh crores in infrastructure over the next uh, four to five years and uh, this um, under the national infrastructure pipeline a large percentage of this infrastructure is is uh, in the uh, direction of implementing or fulfilling the sustainable development goals so this national infrastructure pipeline would also have a very substantial requirement of financing debt financing as well as equity financing and a lot of it will be in the water sector in renewable energy in uh, in sustainable transportation uh, and, and so on and so forth so this is a ma major opportunity and we hope that uh, the possibility of uh, 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 the setting up of the development financial institution which is also ex expected to to help in deepening the bond market will also lead to deepening a creation of a very robust uh, green bond market in india because that's that's very important at the end of the day to to create green instruments which inspire confidence amongst uh, all the market participants so we hope that all these initiatives including the dfi and the uh, and the uh, national infrastructure pipeline um, uh, will will help the growth of this uh, sustainable finance market uh, i i would also finally close by saying that uh, while uh, while on the debt side i think a lot of work needs to be done because our number of green bond issuances have been issuances have been quite limited we uh, uh, we are also we also i need a substantial amount of green equity financing and uh, i'm, I'm uh, we are very happy also as part of the government uh, national infrastructure fund i mean there is a green platform the green growth equity fund which has been set up uh, i mean which uh, which actually has uh, uh, along with the okay. in, in, assist, in, um, in coordination or in collaboration with the CDC uh, DFID of UK to support uh, a lot of uh, green and sustainable activities include renewable energy financing, uh, tra sustainable transportation financing, etc, etc. So, uh, I mean, we only hope that in the coming years or the coming months and years, a lot more traction is available to actually to, to have uh, to develop more such platforms which will look at some of these uh, opportunities in the, uh, in the in the in the climate and and sustainable investing uh, sectors uh, especially in the areas of equity financing so with these few words i i end and i wish the conference all success we hope that uh, your conference comes up with uh, with substantial recommendations 
on how uh, we may uh, accelerate the growth of the market uh, from various perspectives, both from the, the role the market participants can perform, uh, as well as in terms of what policymakers and regulators can contribute by uh, by updated and uh, uh, and and stand and standardization of regulation regulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. You've given us the peeping to, I think, vast amount of work which is happening across departments and within government of India. Uh, it's it's amazing kind of in-depth work which is happening. Uh, it's not just a session that we're doing on sustainable finance. There is the work which is happening uh, in FIKI on a regular basis. We also have uh, EST task force and two of the members of the EST task force, uh, Amit and Govind are present here and we'll be very happy to interact with you on the work which is happening in the sustainable task force and come up with, you know, to understand what's happening and how we can contribute to those, those discussions. So with these words, thank you very much, sir, for joining in uh, today for uh, uh, this uh, session and for your keynote address. Uh, so uh, may I now request, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Suman Chaudhary uh, from Acute to uh, kindly uh, make your uh, remarks, please. Uh, over to you, Mr. Chaudhary. Sure. So let me uh, share the presentation first. Thank you. Is it visible? Well, we are putting up your presentation. Uh, after Mr. Chaudhary is done, Amit, may I request you to kindly take the, the okay. discussions forward with the panel? Okay. 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 Uh, good afternoon to uh, to Sri Rajaraman, uh, my fellow speakers, and everyone in the audience. It's a pleasure uh, to be uh, participating in this session on sustainability finance, and I would like to thank Fiki for this opportunity. Clearly, ESG and sustainability finance have become much more than buzzwords to date. And their significance in the investment world is actually increasing faster than what many market participants would like to think. Before I uh, go into the landscape on sustainability finance, let me quickly give you a brief on the Equity Group, which I represent. Equity Ratings is a rating agency with a vintage of 16 years. We had started as a semi rating agency in 2005, but became a full licensed credit rating agency in 2012. We have assigned over 8,700 ratings since 2012 for not just bank loans, but also bonds and other structured debt instruments. One of the distinguishing aspects for us is our strong institutional ownership, which includes major domestic financial institutions, as you can see here, as well as Dun & Bradstreet, which is a global data and analytics company. One of the important milestones for us last year has been the setting up of India's first ESG rating company, ESGRisk.ai, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of equity ratings. ESG Risk has already produced ESG assessments for the top 500 listed companies of India. So coming back, rapid economic growth and the growing world population have put enormous pressures, as we all know, on the natural ecosystem over the last few decades. Further, there are also increasing concerns on social inequities the world over due to the growth in that growth income. There is a collective global realization that growth needs to be sustainable to reduce risks to lives, livelihood, and the climate. There are timeline-based targets for governments on sustainable development goals and nationally determined contributions or NDCs on aspects like carbon emissions. Therefore, there has to be an overarching incentive framework, as, as has been shown here, to encourage sustainability projects and also to the monitor the progress towards sustainability. When we talk about the frameworks which are set by the regulators or by the governments, as you can see here, they can be in terms of directed lending, prudential regulations by central banks, fundraising at a sovereign level, some of the aspects that Sri Rajaraman touched upon, and importantly, the sustainability disclosures by the corporate sector. In the Indian context, a significant number of initiatives have already been taken in terms of uh, public and regulatory policies. Some of them have been enumerated here. 
um, as as mentioned earlier, you have uh, SEBI coming out with detailed uh, disclosures, which is called business reportability and sustain uh, business responsibility and sustainability reporting, which is mandatory for the top thousand listed companies from next year. There are several incentives which are already putting being put into place for solar projects, EVs, electric vehicles, the other green products. As Sri Rajaraman mentioned, there are initiatives that have been taken by the Ministry of Finance, Constitution Institution of National Action Plan on climate change and climate change finance units. All of this are, are expected to, to uh, you know, lead to some of the further measures in this case. Uh, RBI, the, center, uh, the regulators have also been putting uh, some of their uh, initiatives into place. SEBI has issued uh, guidelines that is some time back for green bond issuances. RBI already has renewable energy, for example, under priority sector lending. And more, I think social, uh, there are some new measures on social stock exchange that are also in the works. Let's, do, let's look at some data on the global green bond issuances. Uh, and this is a very broad picture since 2008 on, on such bond issuances. As you can see, while the quantum of, of bonds that are being raised across geographies may be substantial, uh, the issue is that as a percentage of total financing, green financing is still a very small percentage. Uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, that's, as, as Sri Rajarman also mentioned, much more would need to be done. And the, the good news is that since the pandemic, the volumes have been increasing and at a frenetic pace. For example, some data I would like to quote from the UK think tank, Climate Bonds Initiative. In the first quarter of, of, of this year, calendar year 2021, $107 billion of, of green financing has happened. And uh, last year, that is the whole of 2020, it was around $270 billion and $107 has already happened in first quarter itself. And so global investment banks are talking about $650 billion for the whole of this year. I think some of my fellow panelists will be able to throw uh, much more light on this. Uh, but again, the issue is that you need to see uh, uh, much more uh, uh, here because as a proportion of total financing, it is still uh, very less. Importantly, as Sri Hajaraman also mentioned, the requirements are huge. So some, some of this has been captured in this slide. So the annual requirement, as we have estimated for, for India on green financing is expected to be $170 billion, all forms of, uh, of green financing. And this is necessary to meet the NDC targets by of, of the Paris Convention. Uh, and I think this ties up with what Jyoti also mentioned. I think McKinsey study is start talking about 2 trillion by 2030. This is more or less tying up with that. So clearly, this is a huge kind of requirement. And, and this will mean also an annual demand on the banks of about $66 billion. So I think a paradigm shift would be needed in terms of green financing to achieve uh, this kind of a situation. Let me now give a very broad perspective on the assessment framework for corporate sustainability or in other words, ESG assessment. Now the first step is the identification of relevant ESG risk. As we all know, this risk are, are not generic, they are company and industry specific. And the next step is the evaluation of the risk management uh, framework of the entity uh, that is in question. Essentially, what is the policy? What's the action plan, the monitoring mechanism to manage the ESG risk? Third is the estimation of the materiality of this risk, uh, of this risk panning out. And therefore, they need to be suitably weighted based on the relative importance. Finally, uh, scoring is undertaken to reflect the materiality of this risk and the robustness of the risk management framework. Actually, if you look at it, it is not just about one-time exercise, doing a one-time exercise. It's also about 
monitoring the ESG performance because, as you know, the risks and the performance continues to evolve over time. This is a typical uh, comp uh, ta data taxonomy that you, you tend to have for, for uh, an ESG assessment. For example, for ESG risk, there's three categories of E, S, and G is, is broken up into 19 themes, 35 key issues, 525 indicators, and 739 data points. So it's a kind of a comprehensive uh, identification of risk factors that comes into place. The assessment approach, as I said uh, before, involves scoring uh, each and every uh, scoring uh, each and every uh, uh, on each and every data point uh, based on the company's uh, specific performance. Then you apply the materiality and the weightage. Then you aggregate the scores. There is a flexibility which is given to the analyst to make some changes and adjustments in the materiality as and when required. And the other important part is here the benchmarking. It's not just enough to come with a score and a map rating, but it's also important to benchmark it with the industry peers to give uh, the right perspective on where the particular corporate stands. This is the typical rating scale, which is in line with uh, what a traditional rating scale is with an ESG as prefix. And the data sources for such ESG assessments are typically available in the public domain. You now have, as we discussed, we will have BRSR enhanced disclosures. There are enough information on the annual reports, company website, news, and stock exchanges notifications. All of these are used for the, the listed company assessments. As far as the green uh, bonds are concerned, apart from the track record and the, you know, the assessment of the ESG factors, what is also important is the, the project evaluation. Uh, how do you evaluate the project? How important it is from the sustainability objective? Uh, what will be the proposed use of uh, the, the uh, proceeds? What impact will it have? The ENS, the environmental and social impact, uh, how will you ensure uh, that the proceeds are, are managed well and, and goes into the purpose for which it is intended? And finally, a more monitoring framework around uh, the progress in terms of the project. So this is how a green bond uh, assessment framework can look like. And uh, uh, ESG risk in particular has put a, a framework or uh, uh, a scale of one to five, where the five is the highest in terms of uh, of uh, you know, in terms of rating, but one important point to uh, mention here is this is not a traditional uh, rating where you look at the repayment capacity. Here you are trying to assess the the uh, ENS that is environmental and social impact of 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 this uh, uh, particular uh, project and the utilization of, of funds for that for that particular objective. And this, uh, the data that you need for this kind of assessments are apart from the uh, what is available in the public domain. You need project specific information, and you also need to track the project performance over a period of time. So I think with this, I would uh, like to conclude, and I would request Mr. Tandon to take over the proceedings for the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Soman. Uh, and uh, let me welcome the my fellow panelists on the discussion today. Uh, we had Mr. Rajaram give us a very sweeping uh, overview of what is happening. But uh, one of the things which struck out uh, from, from the perspective of the panel which we have today is the fact that he spoke about the finance. And uh, he repeatedly spoke about finance, whether it is on the uh, aggregate level, whether it is for project specific, whether it is on the debt side, and whether it is on the equity side. And in, uh, to that extent, we are very fortuitous that we have a very good uh, panel today, all of whom bring in deep insights into uh, the financing uh, and all what goes into it. So I'll very quickly introduce the panel. And 
uh, what I'm going to tell, uh, you know, just in the interest of time, rather than have a discussion, what I'm going to request is each of the panelists to kind of uh, speak a little bit about the areas which is of uh, uh, which they are a subject expert on. And uh, depending on how we are with the time, we can then throw it open for for questions. So very quickly, just a quick introduction uh, to the panel. I have uh, uh, Sandeep Kakkaria. He's with uh, Citibank and a senior relationship manager. He's looking at markets and securities. Uh, then we have Rahul uh, Sheth. Rahul is uh, again a banker uh, with uh, Standard Chartered, responsible for their uh, green uh, or their sustainable uh, finance, sustainable bond business uh, operating out of. Uh, Singapore. We have uh, Balika Banerjee. Um, she's actually wearing, uh, in the sense, she's uh, with the uh, National uh, Investment and Infrastructure Fund. And I'm sure, uh, given her background, she again has been a banker in her earlier avatar. She would be able to throw light both as what the bankers are saying, but also from an equity perspective. I have my friend uh, Govind. Govind. Uh, uh, in a sense, is wearing two hats, uh, you know, while he's going to be speaking as the vice chair of E-Cube Investment uh, and Advisory, which is advising a lot of corporates. Uh, he's been, again, uh, 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 a lender, but he's been with uh, a business house in India, and therefore he kind of uh, would be able to give us great insights uh, with regard to what is happening uh, in various uh, banks. And of course, uh, Sandeep made the presentation and he can uh, give us a sense in terms of what the ecosystem is like. So let me, uh, uh, without much uh, taking up much more of your time, let me kick it off. Let me ask uh, Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep, Mr. Raja spoke about the fact that, uh, you know, there is a crying need for uh, um, uh, funds and sustainable finance. Uh, so can you talk to us about what uh, banks in India are doing? Uh, the question which is often asked is, you know, if you kind of break it up into components and you let's say look at the power sector, uh, they suddenly say that, look, the private sector banks are a little bit more uh, sensitive to uh, sustainability and their global investors, but the uh, government owned banks are kind of quite happy to lend to the power sector. So there are all these dynamics which are playing out in the domestic market as far as lending is concerned. Uh, so what are you saying? Can you walk us through your experience in this? Sure. Uh, sure. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I would say, you know, Amit, we are at the India's wow moment for ESG, you know, and I think really the cat came out of the bag when we had one of India's largest corporates, Rejig and tell us about this whole, what do you call, ESG for a, and I think that was clearly. But even before that, uh, you know, in India till July, we have seen around about 10 ESG bond issuances totaling to over, over around about 5 billion. And as you know, my friend Suman told us that, you know, 600 billion, trillion, billion dollars will be surpassed. I would like to tell the audience that as of July only, we have crossed $594 billion of worldwide you know, uh, sustainable bond issuances versus 243 billion, which was uh, till the same period of that time, you know. So clearly we are seeing, uh, you know, the whole genre of fixing of uh, sustainable bonds coming through right from sovereigns. And, you know, instead, I very proudly, we can say that in India, for the first time, we have seen a KPI linked ESG bond that got placed last, uh, this uh, in the month of July, uh, as you all have ever seen, a, a utility manufacturer that a utility agency in India did these bonds, whereby the market agreed to him achieving in future certain KPIs with respect to ESG. So that's showing, you know, the whole market is what you call coming to that. Before I come to banks, you know, Amit, I would really like to say to most of the participants and the people who are watching that, you know, I think in India, we should be really proud because today, most of our fund managers today use all their funds, even though they have the ESG funds are very small, but most of the funds are what you call look through the ESG lens and they look through the ESG scorecards, you know. And so therefore, the integration of this ESG factors into the whole investment process which was led by the mutual funds today is contagiously catching on to the banks also, Amit. 
today with the advent of fintech and with the advent of rating agencies like acute bloomberg etc i am seeing banks talk to us and talk to people that we should develop a credit engine that not only scrubs information from the various financial portals that they have but also from some of these rating what do you call esg relating factors from acute from sustainability and from the other vendors in such a way that they now derive information not only from the company disclosed information but also from the company inferred information this is a very important change and discussion amit which i have never had in my you know 25 years of dealing with credit with the psu banks and with everybody they are now looking to invest into this and you know this i think you know the last three to four months i have engaged this conversation a little bit more because after the world saw that how esg rating and scores actually saved some banks from taking a loss in the wire card scenario so if you all uh, what you call realize that the esg scores got certain global banks to pull back some of their lines and which saved the day so based upon that there have been a lot of board discussions on this whole aspect here and instead you know it gives me great pleasure to also inform you that today not only banks are looking at loans but amit you know certain private sector foreign banks and even public sector banks are collaborating with imf and the other people to ensure sustainability finance for sustainability farming and other commodity ventures you know so that you're looking to basically finance sustainable fi farming and agriculture and commodities and which i thought was something which is the need of the art today we all use organic food we all use organic stuff etc but and if i and if i as a financer can certify under the un programs etc even a simple thing like i don't you know not people never knew that there's a un sustainability rice platform for aggregation of rice and i've seen talks and with this whole trade platform coming into being what the finance minister and all that stuff i think that is uh, i think it's these small parts are really adding up to the big picture of finance and you know i would really uh, thank the government to take these steps in the right direction for giving encouragement to such stuff here so it is india's wow moment on sustainability finance and i think as they say the picture has just started keeping in mind the time i hand back to you amit well th thank you very much i think what you uh, it's a very important uh, uh, point which you're making in terms of the pace of change and uh, i agree someone who's been again observing what has been happening and in some sense a participant uh, I, i keep saying that look uh, if i uh, if if you know i i, I thought i kind of tell people who are here uh, listening to this uh, seminar that look if you're hearing it today and there's another uh, webinar uh four to six months from now don't say that you know it you need to go back and dial in because so much would have changed in the short period of time that you know what you've heard uh four or six months ago may no longer be relevant today uh so i think that's a very important point and the other point which you made it's not just corporates but you know banks are pushing it to uh the retail level and i kind of i have my own anecdotes but in the interest of time uh you know you spoke about the bond market uh, the green bond market and the sustainable bond market and how rapidly it's grown so we're fortunate we have uh, rahul here rahul uh, uh, heads this function for uh, standard chartered bank so rahul will you walk us through uh, what you're seeing what the dynamics are uh, how the market is uh, has changed and what do you expect to see happen over uh, the uh, next uh, 10 to 24 months No, absolutely, and and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think you know just just going back to where uh, Sandeep left, this is definitely a wow moment, not only for for the Indian uh, ESG scene. I'd say uh, globally, we've come to a point where uh, ESG bonds, ESG financing as a percentage of total financing, has significantly gone up. And 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 you know, being a numbers person, uh, if you if you look at the emerging markets you know this used to be esg label bonds used to be about 1% in 2016 um and that was a time where people were questioning whether this is a fad will whether this will pass 
Um, but now, in, in certain markets, this is between 17 percent of flows and this is only going one way and that's north so uh, when you have uh, uh, one fifth of your total flows uh, in ESG level bonds that tells you uh, in a how important this is one from a from a, a total volume perspective but also the whole ecosystem then uh, changes to adapt itself uh, to these kind of bonds right from uh, you know the, the the folks who are in the market like intermediaries like ourselves uh, at Standard Chartered, um, uh, along with that, the clients who are issuing, um, as well as you know the uh, sales folks who are talking to investors on the other side, who are increasingly developing dedicated funds for these issuances. Uh, the whole ecosystem, the knowledge base of that ecosystem, is is significantly ramped up. And 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 just to your your point on things might change completely in four months. I just reduced that to four days. I think in four days, people will, will you know, will be talking a different tune altogether. So, you know, totally, totally agree with those points just on, on a more amplified note. Um, now, just, just put things into context. Uh, globally, as, and as, as I mentioned, we're running on total volume basis. We're running more than two times of what we did last year. And last year was a record year from the previous year, uh, being 80% higher than the previous year. Um, so clearly, all records have been shattered and we will continue to get shattered. Uh, but structurally, what has changed in this market, I think that is one that we need to keep in mind uh, as we project into the future. Uh, so, so, um, and I'll go back in, in time in terms of where it all started and where it has reached. So back in 2007 and 2008, this product sort of really started coming about. Uh, green was the only uh, product in the market uh, and, and it was more the of uh, you know the the supranational entities like the world banks, IOCs, etc., you know, who had their own policies, who had a developmental agenda, um, and and just had a, a lot of investor faith into in, into into whatever they did. Uh, move into uh, 2015, 2016. That's the time where we started seeing a lot more corporates uh, come into the picture. Uh, so it did take a long time before green bonds became a little more mainstream, but still we were talking of volumes in, in the context of, uh, of about 50 to 60 billion uh, in those years. Um, so in even you know, what really changed was that, and, and this is where I bring the distinction between the West and the East. Uh, this product really emanated uh, in, in, a, in uh, a lot of the Scandinavian countries, which, which were the first who were the first adopters by, by, by the DNA being uh, being more focused on ESG and SDGs, um, and and there it was what we call an invest factor because investors had dedicated money uh, to chase these bonds. When we come to the east, it has been a lot more of a regulatory push factor, uh, and where we've seen guidelines, uh, you know, and across when when I look at east, when I look at across Asia, seeing guidelines. Uh, being set up, regulators, uh, you know, adopt uh, these uh, and accept these global lines and then look to set targets. Uh, if, we, if we put in, in in India's context, we have a very uh, uh, strong uh, renewable energy uh, mix change, uh, you know, between now and 2022 and, and also 2030, uh, which requires a significant amount of investment. So that regulatory push, uh, when you look at India, when you look at China, when you look at Singapore, Hong Kong, that got the constituents in the system uh, to, uh, to to change towards uh, the uh, a sort of, uh, you know a, a high volume of issuance. Uh, if you look at in, in this uh, you know in, in terms of how this progressed after 2016, um, up until then it was green bonds, but then came a, a new variety of product uh, where when you look at ESG, you also have a social element which had been ignored. Till we started having the social bond principles uh, come into play, and then we had the social bond uh, guideline um, uh, uh, bonds come into play in a, in a bigger way, uh, which allowed a lot of issuers who had not accessed this market because they were not, they didn't just by nature of the businesses, they didn't have green assets, they were able to access this market with uh, a sustainability which had both green and social assets combined. So that brought about a new uh, you know, a variety of issuers and, and that sort of gave a big boost to the market. And you know, we saw what we saw in the last year, especially with the pandemic, a lot of issuers, especially the governments, uh, they funded their, uh, their pandemic budgets via um, some of these social and sustainability issuances. You know, we ourselves led, uh, have led trades for sovereigns like uh, like Indonesia, who's, you know, who funded their uh, $24 billion budget uh, with a 
$3 billion sustainability uh, issuance, you know, focused a lot on the pandemic refinancings. Um, and, and even the EU has, has done probably the largest volumes in, in, this, in this format. But what has been the biggest structural shift over the last one year, I think that's, that's what's, what's going to determine how, how, how this market is moving forward. Um, in the last one year, the ICMA, which is the governing body on this, uh, has come out with two new products. One is transition finance and, and the second is sustainability link. Now, transition finance uh, is uh, both of these bonds are basically designed more for what we call harder to abate sectors or the brown sectors or, or the corporates who are looking to transition from where they are to where they need to be under the Paris agreements or under sort of the national laws. Um, and this includes, uh, you know, manufacturing, cement, aviation, steel, um, um, you know, and, and, and various other sectors who, who have come out and issued in these formats. Um, too much detail and we can leave it for q a in terms of how how these differ but essentially the the, the, the main difference is um that sustainability link bonds and this was this was also talked about it uh, have a, a, a kpi or a, or a social kpi attached to the bond and if on the non if if, you, if the issuer doesn't meet that yeah, there might be a step up attached to, uh, to that so there's a bit of a penalty carrot and stick approach uh more stick than carrot for now and transition bonds is one uh, you know, you aspire towards achieving your net zero 2030 or net zero 2050 targets uh, again by allocating these as uh, issuances into assets which allow you for that transition. For example, uh, you know, when we led a transaction for CLP out of Hong Kong, we're doing a fuel switch from coal to uh, natural gas, and natural gas is a transition fuel. Uh, and finally, so when Rahul, I look I'm at this, Rahul, I'm going to stop you. Yeah. I'm going to stop you. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, your passion comes through, and you're clearly very, very uh, you know, what you're saying is quite interesting, but uh, I have my one eye on the clock. So let me and we'll maybe come back to you in the Q&A session. Q &A session. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, let me kind of, uh, you know, we've had uh, both you and Sandeep talk a little bit about what is happening on the debt side. But uh, equally, uh, the equity side is uh, critical and uh, we can't have anyone better than Malika to come talk about, talk us through. Uh, what is happening on the equity side i'd like you to focus on one particular aspect which is given the fact that a lot of the projects have a fairly long uh, shelf life uh, they would be there for 15 years 20 years how do you think about it because between now and then the policies would have changed very significantly the landscape would have changed very uh, significantly so first give us an overview of the equity and then how do you think long term in a sector which is changing so rapidly uh, over to you Thank you, Amit. I'll try and be very, very brief, keeping an eye on the time. Uh, so sustainability as a theme has really emerged uh, globally. I would say really gained momentum over the last 18 to 24 months. Um, you know, earlier this year, I think it was in April, we had uh, Tamasek BlackRock, uh, you know, make this mega partnership announcement of uh, a slew of funds which which have not been detailed of five billion dollars or so so you know i have to say that uh, niif which i am a part of we we we, we were uh, quick off the bat uh, uh, earlier in 2018 uh, mr rajaraman mentioned ggf it's a fund that uh, we in niif set up along with dfid of the uk <clears throat> and I think we could easily say that this is India's first decarbonization fund. And uh, GGAF is not just focused on renewable energy, which is clear, really, uh, you know, the largest amount of capital is being seen in that, that space. But it's also looking at e-mobility, waste to, wa waste to energy, water. So it's looking at the uh, entire spectrum of renewable energy services. Um, from NIIF's perspective, we have an infrastructure fund of $2.3 billion, and we have a $3 uh, billion odd pool of uh, co-investment capital alongside. And as Mr. Rajaraman also mentioned, I mean, infrastructure is really at the center of all this green um, uh, evolution. And um, so we, we, by far, are today the largest amount of dedicated India capital for the infrastructure space. Um, and um, what we are seeing today is that the most capital is really flowing into the renewable energy space. 
I was looking at some numbers. So in 2017, banks had lent some 60,000 crores to thermal energy, thermal power projects. And by in two years down the by the third year, that is 2019, banks had lent to only two projects, two thermal power projects, and um, this was just a thousand uh, crores. So it's clearly, you know, the the pace of investment flowing into um, uh, non-renewable energy has reduced, has reduced significantly. Has it really been picked up, um, you know, likewise in equal amounts in the renewable energy space? That is not the case. We were we were targeting in India. We were targeting uh, about 15 to 25 gigawatts of renewable energy being implemented per annum if we are to achieve our targets. What we have achieved is about 8 to 12 gigawatts of renewable energy capacities being implemented. I mean, there's there have been a host of regulatory changes. The real game changer actually was SECI and NTPC coming in to take a discom risk. And I think government has been very proactive in trying to address the concerns of both lenders and uh, equity investors like ourselves in this space. Having said that, the last uh, 12 months have seen significant uh, headwinds in the renewable energy space. The pace of actual implementation of projects has definitely come down. And this is due to both global and uh, local reasons. Uh, panel prices have shot up. Uh, uh, there is, um, you know, freight prices are at an all-time high. Commodity prices are up. Um, domestically, there's uh, there are protectionist measures which are being brought in place. So this has, you know, sort of slowed down the pace of investment. But having said that, uh, we are very hopeful that uh, we are seeing panel prices moderating, and we see that as continuing. And by December or so, hopefully things will be uh, much more manageable. And even here locally, I mean, we, there are other changes that are being brought about, and we expect things to pick up again in this space. Uh, the only other one sure. line I'd add on uh, the other parts of the renewable and uh, of the sustainable spectrum, whether it be water, energy efficiency, waste to energy, etc., the volume of projects and the scale of projects is still fairly small. And we'd really, uh, you know, there's capital that's ready and waiting, but uh, we we also have to get the projects that are large enough to take this. Okay, Thank, you. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. You know, with four billion, over $4 billion at your command, you would be looking at large projects. Uh, that's a nice... Uh, 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 you know, opportunity to segue into uh, move on to Govind. Govind, uh, we've heard about uh, global changes. Billions of dollars are flowing in. Our Indian core and uh, Balka spoke about the fact that you know they're looking at large projects. You've kind of uh, looked at it from both ends. Uh, one is advising corporates as well as uh, helping them uh, turn green. Are corporates really ready for uh, this change which is taking place? Yeah, so I mean, thanks. Uh, I think a lot was spoken about the sheer scale of flows. So undoubtedly, there is a lot of flow, especially from uh, equity as well as debt investors outside India. So I think the appetite is very clearly there. The uh, from the perspective of a company, I think there are two or three reactions that we keep seeing when we meet companies. I think the first is. Uh, which is very positive is almost everyone agrees that some kind of measurement of uh, you know multi-stakeholder uh, elements is now required. Whether you call it ESD or whether you give it some other name, uh, I think uh, beyond pure valuations, I think uh, people are spending some time to assess some of these things. Uh, there is a a sense of I think frustration at the, at the uh, uh, the fact that there are a number of different metrics, the fact that sometimes, you know, scores that come from one entity tend to be very different from scores from another entity and so on. So I think that is one one element which I think sometimes companies struggle with. But I think broadly, 
you know, no well-managed company, whether they have to subscribe to the BRSR or not, uh, disagrees with uh, the need for uh, you know ESG, and uh, you know they've they've put some money behind, I think, uh, scoring it. Also. Managers who are sort of operating on the ground do struggle with you know thirty and forty different new metrics they have to start dealing with. So they have come back frequently saying, look. Um, Materiality element needs to be focused on more, particularly for the industry in question. And I think that's an area where uh, investors and lenders need to start focusing on. It doesn't happen because uh, you know investor strong suit is not engaging with management. Investor strong suit is typically to find uh, you know sort of buy low and sell high. Okay? So they don't really love going and talking to to managers about their uh, sort of the materiality of uh, you know uh, the cost of plastics or whatever it is i think the third let's say actual response you tend to, tend to get from people is uh, look uh, you know a lot of approaches tend to focus on creating policies and therefore increasing boardroom work rather than actually looking on outcomes so you know that this is tended to be a the general way in which corporate governance operates in India, because you have a problem, you you put a policy in place to sort of uh, fix that, uh, rather than the action item. I think that brings me to the point that many people have told, told told me at least personally, which is, I do wish we could see examples of not very intuitively ESG great companies moving up that curve and getting higher multiples and so on. So what if you look at let's say ESG ratings, you never see too many surprises. You know it will always be uh, TCS and it will be Bank and uh, you know Kotak Mahindra Bank. You know it, it it's sort of the usual suspects on any large cap type of scale. So uh, the question there that people are saying is, look, to really get people to move, what would be great is if there are many many examples of companies which have shifted. You know one example which comes to mind is Marico, for instance, between. Over the last two decades, there is a significant sort of multiple accretion that is there, owing to explicit uh, E and S and G activities that they've taken. So, you know, can we see many more of those? And I think that's one area where uh, investors, I think, have to work very hard. The last bit uh, would be on lenders, which is lenders, you know, in many ways have to contribute by financing those actions which ESG comes up with. So when you have an ESG recommendation, it will frequently result in capital in the expenditure of some sort. So it would be, you know, the transition finance or whatever it is. And lenders need to do that. Lenders are reasonably good at doing it in large scale utility kind of projects. So we go to say, uh, you know, SBI and ICC Bank and PTC Financial and so on. So they've been able to do some of this stuff. But the moment you start looking at the, I think uh, Ambalika mentioned this, at the mid-tier of the supply chain, at loans which are, let's say, between 5 crores and 30 crores, this is not the sweet spot of most lenders in India. And I think uh, those, com you know, those companies also are going to have to move up this value chain frequently. Their customers are going to demand that they change their sort of ESG behavior. Uh, and uh, those companies frequently struggle to raise funds at the right price. So I think some structures need to also come in place, whether it is guarantee structures, potentially subsidy, whatever you might uh, say. So I think these are some of the responses I'm hearing from uh, at least uh, the corporate side of things. Back to you. I think you're on mute on it. Before we run out of time, I'll take Jyoti's permission just to continue for another few minutes. There is, of course, a question from the audience, but I treat it much more as a, a suggestion, which is that uh, can sustainable finance be included as a part of priority lending for banks? Uh, so I think uh, that's a uh, if it's a question, uh, I, I think uh, I see it more as a suggestion and uh, maybe Fiki could actually add it to its uh, wish list uh, in its discussions with the finance ministry. But we are also fortunate that Mr. Rajaram is there, and uh, in case he can communicate this message uh, uh, to uh, the concerned persons and also champion this uh, within the uh, ministry uh, and through them through RBI. Uh, I, I I know uh, we've kind of run out of time, but uh, Suman, uh, let me kind of 
uh, have you just comment on the fact that the ecosystem so there was talk about you know how do you measure it govind spoke about the fact that uh, you know you're high with one uh, uh, you've got a high score with one uh, agency a low score with the other so can you very quickly walk us through the ecosystem which is out there how reliable is it what do you think of the quality of data you've got disclosures which are coming earlier in the brr uh, hopefully uh, uh, the brsr will be a bit of an improvement in terms of at least the quality uh, just your uh, closing comments on that and uh, let me request you just to keep your comment very short maybe two at best three minutes over to you sure of course thank you Amit. so uh, as you know globally there today the esg assessment market has already evolved and there are a lot of market participants in india it is true it is evolving so if you look at the current ecosystem uh, they were, as you know, uh, MSCI and sustainability analytics, I mentioned that they have some coverage on Indian listed corporates, uh, but it's not uh, really that comprehensive. As far as I know, it will be around 200 corporates that they typically cover. We have started uh, in ESG risk.ai covering around 500 NAC top listed corporates, and that's a recent development. I understand other domestic rating agencies are also thinking of uh, deploying some tools uh, for the listed corporates. Hopefully, this 500 will go to 1000 in some time, as you mentioned, that with BIRS are coming into place, more disclosures and quality disclosures will, will be available. Now, the, the issue is that how, how, how do we assess and how robust it is? As of now, a lot of this, you know, is dependent on the quality of disclosures. How, how transparent are the disclosures and what's the quality? So based on that, you have most of us have, a, you know, kind of proprietary algorithms, which are sometimes and in our case supplemented with, with analytical experience and you come with outcomes, right? And as Govind mentioned, sometimes there may be some, some uh, differences that's coming in, partly maybe due to the information gap or the quality of information. So one of the challenges, I guess, that we in, in the ESG assessment market have to look at is, is how this quality of information and the comprehensive of information picks up. And, you know, I think at some point, the, the concept of ESG audit, because you, there is a risk of greenwashing, right? Greenwashing is a, is, is a significant risk globally. So there is a risk of greenwashing and it needs to be mitigated. So maybe at some form of ESG audit needs to come into place. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's a big question in terms of uh, the data which is presented and the integrity of the data. And that's a broader debate. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, I have approval from Fiki to kind of continue for a few more minutes, uh, given the questions which are coming in from the audience. So Malika, let me come to you. There's a question which says that, you know, there's a, a large pipeline of infrastructure projects which had been identified uh, by the government of India. And so why is it that you're saying that they're not sufficiently large uh, bankable projects? Uh, um, from, a, um, from a green perspective, I'm guessing. Yes, from, uh, just from a green perspective. No, the renewable energy projects that we're doing, I mean, there's enough scale, there are uh, enough projects, there are other headwinds. Uh, banks are actually, from a debt perspective, uh, apart from, it's not a very deep market. We ultimately end up going to the same four, three or four banks, sometimes just the same two lenders. So it's a very, very shallow uh, debt financing market. The bond market is not deep enough. And we are doing a lot of under construction projects. The NIP, the National Infrastructure Pipeline, is a lot of uh, green greenfield projects. We are undertaking that in the renewable energy space. GGF is doing some stuff in um, water, etc. But uh, those projects, I mean, outside the renewable energy and growth sectors are not necessarily large. And we're still to see some of them rolling off the block. But yes, there is a pipeline and it will happen. There's no doubt about it. But uh, as things stand today, this is the situation. Uh, if, 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 
if if i may if i may come in sure. for a brief briefly sure. uh, from the from the supply side there is no uh, uh, what do you say uh, limitation on the number of projects that is up for offer a huge number of uh, projects uh, in the renewable energy sector especially since the as one of the speakers mentioned the, the target has been ramped up to 450 gigawatt i think there will be no shortage i think the problem more seems to be from the point of view of the uh, supply of uh, sustainable finance because essentially what many uh, uh, issuers are finding is that uh, they are not getting a, a better fine finer prices you know in terms of uh, i mean uh, for green bonds visa v perhaps uh, any other kind of bonds I mean. so i guess probably uh, from that perspective i think probably that maybe there is a market uh, information problem or probably i think maybe there is a market standards problem i think so therefore i guess uh, the problem is not going to come from the shortage of uh, projects but more from the point of view of supply of capital but from the from a, from an fpi and fdi perspective i don't think there is a shortfall i think probably once we plug this information gap i'm sure that uh, and maybe the trust gap i think maybe i think more money will flow in nothing at a, at an attractive price maybe at a discount from the from the uh, from the normal market rate so absolutely just to you know, add one thing sorry just ahead. to add one thing there also you can't access the bond market for a uh, greenfield project uh, that's not a risk that i think they are willing to take or at least it doesn't it's not uh, something that's seen today so only when there's a track record of 3 years or so of that company etc can you really access those markets uh, sandeep rahul would you like to weigh in on that because that, you know what you know what green, green, green masala bond. green masala bond yeah no i i totally agree with the comment uh, because green bonds predominantly they work on uh, uh, on on the concept of uh, fungibility and and the concept of uh, a general recourse to the issuer as opposed to a specific recourse to a project uh, or a project finance uh, type of bond although the allocation is to uh, a specific project so what, I, what i'm trying to get to is effectively uh, you know when you look at uh, sorry we are uh, losing the issue and the and the credit profile of, of the issuer as opposed to the specific projects in in contention so so that what that basically means is that essentially it this financing is restricted to uh, issuers of a certain or clients of a certain uh, quality who can actually access uh, the bond markets uh, for that kind of size Just so add on here, Amit, that I think picture has started now. I would say, you know, especially after you've seen the basically the sustainability linked USD bond that recently happened and which we uh, which we co-led, where we saw spread tighten as much as around about fifty basis from the initial offer price. I think it's just started, and I will be as Rahul said. Why four months? It, the uh, the pace will be much faster. So uh, you know, yes, uh, as I say, picture baki hai abhi, and uh, it is definitely a very very rosy picture. So I uh, kind of with that, let's say that with the rosy picture, let me kind of wind up. I'd like to thank all the panelists. I think there are a couple of uh, interesting lessons we've got. One is the size of the bond market, and even uh, what Amalika said in terms of uh, the corpus of funds which is available on the equity side is huge. Uh, the second is the pace of change is unprecedented. So even if you would kind of uh, ask the question about two years back, how large you expect the market to be, everyone would have uh, underest uh, underestimated the size. There are a bit of challenges with uh, uh, data, as was uh, pointed out by Suman. uh govind rightly pointed out that the corporates are prepared but they do have their own sets of challenges uh, particularly uh, the smaller you are uh, the more difficult it is to kind of navigate in this uh, uh, in, in this field and i'd actually end with uh, something which uh, mr rajaraman said in his comment which is kind of stuck with me that covid has acted as a reset and brought back the green agenda in a substantial way and with that uh, let me thank all the panelists and thank the audience for dialing in and uh, uh, back to you jyoti thank you very much no 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 thank you i think you beautifully summed up you know the entire discussion and i would just like to thank mr rajaraman for sitting through uh, this 
and Amit Pen Govin, perhaps as a ESG group, we must go to him, uh, you know, to discuss some of the aspects that we've been raising. And to each one of the panelists for, you know, really giving your inputs uh, into this very important uh, subject. And uh, we look forward to, you know, continuous engagement uh, going forward on this in this area. So thank you once again, everybody. And we come to the close of the session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amit, for doing this beautifully. Thanks. Thank you for getting the panel. Getting the panel. Thank you. Very well done, Amit. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.